Welcome, everybody. I am going to be sharing my uh, presentation in the first 10 minutes as a means of introduction to the tour today. And uh, my name is Austin Mast. I'm a, a faculty member in the biology department at Florida State University. And uh, it's my pleasure and um, is something that I'm quite proud of to um, manage the Robert K. Godfrey Herbarium at Florida State University, and I'll be telling you about it, this important resource at the end of the tour, uh, after others have presented their, um, their herbaria. Um, I'm going to share my screen. As I said, welcome, everybody. This is the first time we've tried this. This is something of an experiment, and uh, I want to thank my co-organizers all of whom you, you'll meet as we go through the next 90 minutes. This is our schedule for the tour. I'll do a brief introduction and then we'll start the visits. We're gonna start with University of Florida, move on to Marie Selby, uh, go to University of South Florida, Fairchild here, and then we'll have a short Q&A. There is a Q&A interface that you should have access to and that will give you an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists, the tour guides. And we'll keep an eye on that and try to answer questions as they pop up. So we're, we're based in, we're talking about Herbaria today. Herbaria are, what we call them, libraries of plant specimens. They're, they're like libraries and they're quite different from libraries in, in some important ways. And I think that'll become clear as we go. This is a typical specimen that you'd find in a library, in a <laughs> herbarium, excuse me. Uh, these specimens have been collected in the field. They've been pressed, flattened, dried, mounted on archival paper with labels. And those labels have important information of the who, what, where of the collecting event. Not all specimens look like this. Sometimes herbaria are maintaining wood specimens. Sometimes they might have glass slides with pollen. There is a real variety of things that you might find in an herbarium. We have here in Florida about one and a half million specimens of, of this type, that is uh, plant specimens. In 20 active herbaria, we have a few inactive herbaria, but we have 20 active herbaria, and you can see them mapped here. The ones that we'll be presenting today are in orange. You can see that as orange place marks and they have labels. The black place marks are those that are not represented today, but um, are equally important. These are all uh, valuable resources for the scientific community and also for society, as I hope comes through in the tour today. Florida is an important uh, biodiversity hotspot in North America. You can see that here. This is illustrating the importance of really the entirety of Florida. You can see the Florida panhandle is, is lighting up there, as is parts of the Florida peninsula. We have about 3,200 native plant species here in Florida. Each of these roughly 1.5 million specimens represents the work of a collector. Uh, as I mentioned, we go out into the field and we collect these specimens and press them and, and then we dry them back here in the herbarium. These collectors have been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is a picture of Bob Godfrey for whom the herbarium here is named. I had, I never met Bob Godfrey. He uh, passed before I started this position in 2003. Uh, but this is him as a young man, and he was an important collector for this herbarium. He was my predecessor's predecessor. These collectors uh, were active a long time ago, in some cases, even back to before Florida was a state. You can imagine that field work was quite different at that time. You wouldn't have been taking your car out into the field, you might have been taking a horse and wagon. 
many types of activities happen here in herbaria and i think that'll become clear as we uh, visit the herbaria around the state prior to 2000 most of the uses of herbaria occurred in herbaria that is if someone wanted to use our resources here they would visit or they would request a loan and it was something like it's something like interlibrary loan that is we will send specimens to other herbaria and someone can use it there and then they'll return them since 2000 we have made a real effort as a community not just among herbaria but more generally in other collections as well like those that are curating birds and fossils and insects uh, to represent our collections digitally and um, to share that online. And this is useful for many reasons. As scientists, we, we find it quite useful and that'll come through, but I wanted to point out a few reasons why it's useful to people who might have other uses for it. Um, this is an example in which I was taking photographs of this by Burnham in Wakulla County. And I was looking at the leaves and thinking, well, that's not quite what I expect it to look like. And what I did when I got home is I uh, logged on to our herbarium website and I looked at the sheets that we have of this species from that county. And uh, you can see that there is quite a bit of variation in the leaf shape and that I found reassuring, I thought that might make what I was seeing uh, reasonable in that context. It's also possible to uh, find species, relocate species using the information uh, in our collections. This is a map that is showing the distribution of the specimens that have been geocoded uh, of the same species. And I was interested in the ones from Wakulla County. In fact, there was one that I found that had a very similar leaf shape to what I was seeing that was also collected very close to where I took the picture. So this is a way for you to find things that you might like to appreciate, maybe take a photograph. You can focus on a different uh, aspect of the data by uh, focusing on collector. Uh, this is my gra grand aunt, my wife's grand aunt, uh, her great grandfather's sister, Frida Wiley, who was uh, at the American Museum of Natural History up until her death at the age of 99. She used to lead bird walks in Central Park, and this is her in the center. Um, and she collected prolifically, um, and we can map where she collected and know where she went. And uh, I spent an afternoon with my wife's father uh, two weeks ago, looking at this map and just talking about what he knew about and what he didn't know about. So there's a lot of value in creating digital representation of these specimens that is liberating the data from the cabinets. I want to mention before we get into the uh, tour that there are opportunities for you to help with this. Uh, there's a project called We Dig Florida Plants. And uh, at the moment, there is an, uh, a campaign to create digital data about grasses collected here in Florida. You could just look for We Dig Florida Plants online and find the Zooniverse page that uh, offers the opportunity to help us create the data. Uh, this is the interface and you can see the, the label there that has the who, what, where, and there are prompts on the right there that you would fill out. We've had a lot of help from people uh, creating data about our specimens and we're grateful to them. And we share that uh, by sending gifts. Um, small tokens of our thanks. This is a good time to help. It's currently the uh, spring We Dig Bio. Uh, we Dig Bio is a global campaign to create data about biodiversity specimens. It's in the context of Citizen Science Month, which is in April. 
Finally, it's important to recognize that the specimens are valuable time capsules of information besides what's on their labels. Uh, this is an example of using the specimens themselves, that is a plant material, to reconstruct some important things. Uh, for example, you can sequence the whole of what is represented in the leaf and uh, understand what kinds of diseases arrived in particular places at particular times and reconstruct history using that. So this is more like a rare book library than a public li library. It's not possible to simply order a new copy of something. Um, there is no time machine for us to go back to 1940 and collect what was collected then. There are many ways to support your local herbaria besides getting involved in uh, helping us to database. And I encourage you to look for opportunities to uh, do so. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. We are going to go next to University of Florida. All right, excellent. I guess we're good to go. Um, well, I wanna say uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's really nice to, to, to be here ourselves. Um, this is University of Florida Herbarium. I'm the curator of the University of Florida uh, Herbarium and an assistant curator here in the Florida Museum of Natural History, uh, uh, Lucas Majur. And and I'm uh, Alan Frank. Uh, I'm the collections manager here. Uh, I was at Florida International University before this and, and then University of South Florida. So I uh, bounced around a little bit, but now the collection manager here in Gainesville. So we're in the north part of Florida. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit, then I'll hand it over to Lucas. Uh, our herbarium has about 500,000 uh, specimens, mostly uh, mounted vascular plants. So this is our typical collection object, I guess. It's, uh, a specimen sheet, uh, but we do have algae as well. That's probably our least used collection, at least active, but they're usually on sheets as well. We got about 3,000 of those. Uh, seed collection, so we got maybe two, 3,000 seeds and vials. Um, one of our very nice collections are bryophytes. We had a, a biologist, Dana Griffin here for a while. Uh, and he studied a lot in neotropics, so very rich collection of bryophytes. So we typically put those in packets, which is small plants. And, uh, we treat lichens the same way. So we have about uh, 20,000 lichens, a lot from Florida. Oh, I'm not even showing anything there. There we go. So there's a nice uh, lichen of Cladonia, pretty common genus. Some uh, more unusual things is we have uh, a wood collection. So these are nice polished wood samples. We got some unpolished branches as well. But, uh, we have about 15,000 of those. Those are fairly uncommon, but it's a neat thing we have and certainly value it. But uh, we have about 300,000 vascular plants, and that's what most of our research focuses on in our collections. Uh, this one. It's pretty nice. This is collected by Alvin Wentworth Chapman, A.W. Chapman. So I like to point him out because I kind of consider him the first botanist to take residence in Florida and begin very intensive collecting. So there's a few old collections from around the late 1700s, but it's Chapman in the 1830s or so and almost till the end of the his life in the 1890s that really lived in Florida and collected lots of specimens. But he was a doctor by practice. So this is uh, the gopher apple. Yeah, that's the common name of that. So they find this uh, around gopher in Florida's habitats a lot. And, uh, and one other specimen I wanted to highlight, um, and Austin kind of touched on this, we have records of what once was and this is a species, a genus species, Bacchus dioica. See right there. It's, it's, it's kind of a shrub in the sunflower family. And this was collected in uh, Brickle Hammock. So that's right uh, where downtown Miami is. And this species uh, no longer occurs in Florida. So this is how we know it used to be here in Florida as a native population, but it is no longer here. And uh, we have a record of that. 
And this, this was a specimen from the New York Botanical Garden. So we get a lot of specimens through exchange. Uh, people share specimens. So our staff did collect this, but someone from New York did and they shared that with us. So you'll find a lot of overlap between our various collections. And then we have a lot of unique things as well. Our herbarium started in um, 1891 at uh, Lake City. So it's a little bit further north of uh, Gainesville in a, uh, the Florida Agricultural College. And then around 1906, the university formed and it all moved down to Gainesville. Uh, Peter Rolfs was an uh, early curator. Urban West followed him. Uh, Dan Ward, Walter Judd, Norris Williams. And now our curator is Lucas Majeur. So I'll hand it over to him. He can talk a little bit about some of his uh, research. Oh, awesome, awesome. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, so, you know, we have roughly uh, 500,000 specimens here and we're, you know, as Alan mentioned, and we're very active in uh, generating more collections and, and building our collections and also trying to build um, not only the diversity and numbers of species that we have in the collections, but also from the areas that we collect in. And so our, our collections are really strong in the southeastern United States, as well as the Caribbean. And we're, we're generating more and more collections from other parts of the Americas. So, um, if, you know, desert Southwest, as well as other parts of uh, uh, Central America, South America. And so we're really, um, you know, working towards diversi diversifying our collections even more. Um, so we do actually have a lab associated, a molecular lab associated with your barium that's uh, part of my lab group. And we do uh, a range of different types of uh, research and in plant evolutionary biology. And some of those are involved in really interesting plant families, such as the family Melisomatheci. There's actually a specimen from the Dominican Republic uh, that was collected. Uh, uh, I collected this in 2019. This is one group that uh, we're currently working on in trying to understand the evolutionary relationships across essentially the worldwide distribution of this family. Um, we also work uh, quite extensively on the plant family Cactaceae. So not only uh, myself, but Alan here as well has done extensive work in the family Cactaceae. And this is one of the uh, collections that we are trying to build and, um, and make it even more significant here in, in, in our collection. And so, uh, you know, what we, why these specimens are reported like this is oftentimes we're, we're looking at species that have a relatively limited distribution or sometimes a very poorly known distribution. So by collecting these in the field, this is a specimen I collected in uh, uh, Antigua and the Lesser Antilles back in September 2019. By making these collections, it actually enables us to understand more fully the distribution of these species and also to look at the, what we call the morphology, so how the plant looks in itself. And these also serve as uh, records for any kind of molecular work we might be doing. So if we extract DNA and sequence that DNA, we have to have a, a what we call a voucher specimen to back that up. And so this having specimens like this makes our science repeatable. Um, and so uh, we do a lot of collecting for our, our research projects and just to help us understand the overall distribution of, of biodiversity in the areas that we work in. So now what I think I'll do is um, we'll do sort of a quick whirlwind tour around the herbarium so you can see some of our facility. Okay, that sounds great. So uh, we're gonna go into the molecular lab. I'll show you guys, hey Luca. This is uh, Lucas Bacci, a postdoc that works in the lab. He's actually, I think probably working on some DNA extractions and a number of other things right now. So this is, a relatively small molecular lab that we have associated with the herbarium. We do a DNA extraction here, PCR, things like that. Um, and so it's really nice to have this associated with the herbarium. Uh, so we can essentially work directly with our specimens, um, you know, uh, very easily having it directly associated. So um, I think yeah. let's show them the imaging sure. station and I will pick up the, the ball yeah, here. So we'll and just show a little bit uh, <laughs> more of our rooms here. Uh, we have you know, we have about half of our collections online, and we're always trying to put more online. Uh, so this is this is our small room where we try to keep the lighting conditions very uh, controlled, and we have our camera in a fixed position to image most of our specimens, and then a computer to get that online. Uh, 
out here we have a series of faces. This is a lot of the unprocessed material. So we just we made labels, but we need to mount it or we need to uh, send it off to someone else, another institution. We also have a nice library I just want to point out. So that's very important for us to have a reference works or identifications or, or species descriptions that we might want to uh, look into. <laughs> our mounters have just left for the day. Yeah, so. This is our mounting room. So this we take a lot of our uh, you know freshly collected material with labels that have been dried and frozen. Uh, to give it a pest and then now it's going to dry and then last i'll just show like the, the main collection room when everything's finished and processed we got one loud room to go through <laughs> so this is our main collection room uh, we're lucky to have uh, compactness that really helps to save space and Cram a lot of specimens all in this one room. And we have like, I think how many, 15 cases long, about one, two, three, six rows or six and a half. And this is just what our typical case looks like. Uh, this is the melastome. So we, we, that's one of the specialties here in our collection is to have uh, the melastome tasty, a lot of collections of those. Our blue is our Caribbean folders. So we got some nice collections in those. So that's kind of the finished product. When we have everything mounted and labeled and hopefully digitized too, right? We're trying to get everything online. So we'll just uh, go back to the main table. Real quick. So that's uh, that's an overview of everything we have here in Gainesville. I guess we have got a couple minutes to spare, but uh, we'll probably see if there's or any questions, or we can move on. Thanks so much, guys. I think take it away, Bruce. Okay, thanks, Austin. Um, well, we want to welcome you to the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens Herbarium. Um, Selby Gardens is a private herbarium open to the private institution, open to the public, and, and founded in 1973. Um, uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank you, Austin, for uh, coming up with this idea and for allowing us to participate in this unique event. It's really fun. Um, as you'll see, we're, we're now in, in currently in temporary headquarters uh, for the herbarium. We're, we're going to be here for two years while our new plant science center building is being constructed. Uh, the building is part of phase one of a 10-year master site plan for Selby Gardens. Phase one will provide state-of-the-art spaces for offices, for barium, spirit collection, library, lab, and plenty of space for collections growth. Uh, the new Hurricane Resilient Science Building uh, is part of a complex including a new welcome center, restaurant, plant shop, uh, a stormwater vault, which will return clean water to Sarasota Bay, um, and a parking structure topped by a massive solar array. Uh, that will provide, uh, make this campus the first ever net positive botanical garden complex in the world. So let's begin. We're going to show you some specimens to our, the to our temporary facilities um, and meet some of the staff and learn about some of our, our specialization. So uh, I'll start with myself. I've been here for 27 years and um, I'm focusing on collections growth and management and uh, uh, programs of inventory, classification, conservation, um, and, a, and a, a special focus on bromeliaceae and myrtaceae. Um, so uh, next I wanna introduce Liz Gandy. She's gonna actually do the tour. Uh, she'll give you a little detail about herself. Um, I'll take over on the camera. Thanks, Tatiana. And then we'll get going. All right, thank you, Bruce. Hi, everybody. As Bruce said, I'm Liz Gandy. I'm an assistant curator here in the herbarium. I have been here as an employee about 2015. In addition to this for everyday curatorial duties, I also work a lot with our specimen data, uh, both in-house and data migration. Um, I also work specifically with Florida projects, Florida conservation projects, botanical inventories, and um, just general, general plant identification. So 
as Bruce said, our, we are right now in temporary quarters. We like to joke that our collections are kind of on a sleepover for two years. Um, so we have certainly had some challenges in this new space, not only the uh, challenge of moving about 130 polar bearing cabinets from one location to another last year. Uh, that was definitely exciting. Uh, we also kind of have a different layout. Instead of having all of our alphabetical sequence in one space, we have um, the divided into five different spaces since this, uh, this building we're in was not originally designed as an herbarium, it was an office space. Uh, we also have cabinets in people's offices, and we have working cabinets scattered in every nook and cranny around the building. Um, so we also have issues of um, being extra diligent about our pest control, uh, monitoring for, um, since we have more in ingress and egress areas with, for their uh, collection. We also have to uh, closely monitor our um, uh, temperatures and humidities, um, and also educate those who work in this area to make sure they're extra careful of the collections. We also have lighting issues. Our people that do filing and work in the actual cabinets oftentimes have to wear headlamps because sometimes the light is so low in certain areas. So we do have a, a special filing headlamp. So that has been um, a little bit challenging, but the best part of this space is that we have been able to have full access to all of our collections. So we're able to continue all of the curatorial work and research that we were already doing uh, without any interruption. So that's been really great and we're, we're super grateful for that. So. Moving on to the collections themselves, um, our collection was started in about 19, 1973, started with a donation of about 6,000 specimens from Callaway Dodson, who was the first executive director of Marie Selby Botanical Garden. Um, and it has grown since then to, we have about 119,000 accession specimens. Um, and our, our collection grows at a rate of about 2,000 to 2,500 specimens per year. Um, our geographic focus, um, since the gardens, Ms. Marie Selby Botanical Gardens itself is focused on epiphytes, uh, naturally our preserved collections are also focused on epiphytes. So about 50% of our preserved collections come from some of the most epiphyte rich families. So as some examples we have, um, oh, and we can't forget, uh, as far as history of our collection here, we have our very first number one, first accession specimen. This is a terrestrial orchid, actually, that was collected by Dr. Carlisle Luer, who is one of the garden's founders. And he is probably one of, if not the most prolific orchid, tax, orchid um, taxonomist of his time. Unfortunately, we <laughs> lost him a couple of years ago, um, but it's really exciting that it's one of his collections that is our very first number one accession, accession plant. So as far, again, back to our taxonomic focus, we have about 40,000 orchids. Um, and this is a beautiful example here, this Dracula from Colombia. We have about, definitely have to get a view of that beauty. And we have about 14,000 bromeliads like this Philanzia here. And also Gizneriads, we have about 11,000 Gizneriads like this columnia here. And we also um, have um, a, a, a nice and constantly growing collection of Florida specimens. This is a paratype here of Liatra sevenensis, which is a, an Asteraceae in the uh, sunflower family uh, that is actually endemic to the central uh, west coast of the peninsula of Florida. So this is really exciting to have. Also very similar to um, uh, what Ellen was speaking about earlier, we also have a um, really interesting a specimen of Bonamia grandiflora that was collected um, in Sarasota County. Um, and this is a federally endangered, here's a photograph of what the live plant looks like. This is a federally endangered member of the morning glory family that's, that's found in scrub and it's actually no longer known from Sarasota County, um, not known anywhere. So this is a really important collection um, documenting that the plant was once present here in our area. Okay, we also have other interesting collections, one of which is known as a carpology collection. This is a really great example of a great big furry fuzzy carpology collection.
Hey, Liz, we, we lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Did you catch all that about the Puya? <laughs> <laughs> all right. One other interesting, um, really super important collection that we have is our collection of type specimens. Selby Gardens has about 4,700 type specimens. These are very, very important um, because these are these are the specimens that the publishing authors have designated as the reference specimen for these the, the these species of plants. Um, and they are super important for identification and for plant reference. If there's ever a question about what is a plant, we can come back to the types. Um, and here's just an example. We do store these. We store these separately. Uh, and in my office, I have to mention uh, where they're specially housed. We keep them along with their original citation. And then here's a great example of a Gisneria type of Columnia Dodsonii, named for who I mentioned before, Cal Dodson. All right. Moving on to another one of our important collections. Right this way. We have a significant collection of what we call spirit specimens. These are collections that are uh, fluid preserved. This room houses a donation from Dr. Carl Moore after he passed. Uh, his estate don donated these to us. These are um, about 13,000 specimens. And here's an example. These are very important, especially to uh, groups like orchids, because it helps to preserve that three-dimensional uh, structure of the flowers and also the plasticity for purposes of dissection and for future study. So this was also a collection that was challenging to house in temporary quarters. We have another room where we house, in, we house our main collection of spirit specimens. We have about 35,000. We have the second largest collection of spirit specimens in the world. And so, as you can see, the room is not quite this small. We had to stack the kind of stack the cabinets up, up right up next to each other, or fit everything in here. But we can't access everything as we move stuff around. So we are actively curating these uh, collections, um, filling them, databasing, barcoding, and that's going on constantly. And we'll meet a few of our folks working on that in just a minute. So right this way, I'd like to introduce one of our newest members, uh, research botanist Dr. Tatiana Adias. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tatiana Arias, and I am a research botanist here at Selby. I have been here for five months already. And the major interest that I have at the moment is to understand the evolution of uh, epiphyte orchids. Um, and the idea is to work with um, neotropical orchids doing um, things like phylogenetics, um, expeditions, taxonomy work, and et cetera. So today we are here at the temporary lab. Um, this is where we do molecular, basic molecular uh, experiments. And uh, this is a um, space that I share with uh, Dr. Sally Chambers. Sally it works or is a specialist in ferns, but she also is working in conservation genetics and conservation biology in general of um, cactus and um, cactus and bromelias. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what else to say. We can do here specific, or we are doing uh, population biology studies, uh, phylogenomic studies, and yeah, using our collections to to implement all this research. Yeah, awesome, Tatiana, thank you so much. So as you can see in our temporary quarters, uh, some of our barium space does share space with the laboratory. Um, and also just a note on, org on organization, we do keep our collections in an alphabetical sequence. Several exceptions to that are the Vermilion East we, um, we do break down by uh, subfamily. And same thing with the Orchidaceae, we break that, those down by geography. We separate those between um, Central America and South America. And we also separate out the Chlorophyllidinae uh, and keep break those down um, alphabetically and geographically as well. So no tour of the herbarium would be complete without um, our, our version of digitization. Um, uh, both the University of Florida and Austin both talked about this process. This is a super important process, which is that taking of the, spe the specimen out of the cupboard and into the digital sphere. 
And this station kind of demonstrates that process for us. This is our this is our temporary offsite imaging station. Uh, we have this um, uh, our camera mounted here. Our lighting system, several strobes with um, a ring light, and our images are here. And then once they're once that image is digitized, here's an example here on the screen of what they might look like. Another important process of digitization is from the taking the specimen itself and recording information like the accession number, the barcode. And as Austin, talk, Austin talked about, that really important data that's found on the label, with the um, location where the plant is found, the plant name, uh, really important description, descriptive text, the collector, collector number, date collected, coordinates, hopefully. All of this is very important information. We can also record information about the specimen itself, such as phenology. And all of that data is gathered uh, for us into our in-house database, which is ROMS 8.0 or 8.1 now. We really like ROMS because it helps to bring together the, um, the living plant records that we have here at the gardens, as well as the preserved plant records. And that's super important for us that so we've been, we migrated to this database last year and really like it. So from here, the data moves into the, um, the online sphere, if you will. We have published our uh, foreign specimens and our bromeliads to CERNEC, which is the um, data portal for the Southeast United States. And from there, we can publish to um, online aggregators such as iDigBio and Gbit. So on our way to our very last stop, this is an example of one of those working cabinets that we have stored in, a nook, in every nook and cranny. Um, these are uncurated specimens. In this case, these are waiting for exchange to other institutions. Institutional exchange is really important for being able to grow our collections and also safeguard our collections by having duplicates stored at other institutions. We have just a few of these. <laughs> so on to our last stop. One of the most important aspects of our, of our work here, I'd like to of course introduce um, and one of our colleagues, Dr. Sean Laporte, who is our live plants collector, uh, live plant um, collection record keeper. Um, he also works on conservation projects such as Cactaceae, um, for conservation of the Aboriginal prickly apple cactus, Carissia aboriginal. Um, we have, this is our, our largest volunteer workroom. So volunteers are one of the most important parts of what we have going on here. None of what you have seen today would be, would be doable <laughs> without the help of our volunteers. We have about 50 active volunteers here in our botany department, um, and they work uh, daily, some from home, thanks to COVID, and some here. They work on um, everything from imaging to georeferencing, which is taking that verbal locality and creating latitude and longitude coordinates as well as transcription of label data. Um, Jane and Norman are both working on curating the uh, spirit collections, as you can see. And Anne is working on uh, label transcription. And this is, a, this is a really critical part of what we do. Um, this is, uh, they're all highly trained and very versatile, something we really appreciate. And also in this, in this room, this also doubles as our mounting room, not just computer work, uh, which is, of course, um, as, as uh, Alan mentioned, and, and uh, uh, this is where we take from the, the um, press, which was where the plants start off in the field. And this is often how we get them on exchange from other institutions, flat in a newspaper with, with a label. And they get mounted on high quality, thick archival paper with where an accession number and a barcode are applied. This is an example of a mounted, mounted specimen. And then we use uh, little drop tags, which um, help to inform the pipeline that this specimen will follow going to imaging, to data transcription, and, acc and accessioning before it is ultimately filed into the alphabetical sequence. So that's about it for us. Uh, Bruce and I will be available for questions at the end. So bye for now. Thanks, Thank Liz. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was fantastic. There is a question in the Q&A that Elizabeth or Bruce, you uh, would probably be the best to answer about what you're storing your um, your what collection then. Thanks so much. We will move on now to USF. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carla Alvarado, um, though some of you might know me as Koala, which is my nickname. Um, I am the new herbarium curator here at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, I've been here uh, officially since December. Um, so bear with me, I am a bit new. 
Um, but I would like to take you on a short journey to learn about USF's collection of more than 300,000 specimens. I'm gonna walk backwards here a little bit because I want you guys to see a little bit of our um, outdoor uh, posters and um, displays here. Now, this is a new display that um, myself and Anita, uh, one of the assistants here, just currently worked on. And I will be talking about this in a moment. I'm just gonna flip around my camera. All right. So I do want to give you a little bit of background um, while you guys admire this display. Um, so the USF Herbarium was planned with the founding of the university in 1956. This was in cooperation with Dr. John Allen, who was the very first president of USF. It actually originated in a place called Chins Chinsey Gut Hill, which is an historic institution in Brooksville, Florida, under the patronage of George R. Cooley, who I have a photo of right here. And that's him at the Chinsey Gut Hill location. Um, the, lo the collection at first had a modest um, 19,432 specimens before it was transferred here to USF Tampa. Um, and, it, uh, and that was in 1960, and that was right before the opening of the very first class at the campus. And the herbarium is now located in the building called CMC, which is the College of Arts and Sciences multidis Multidisciplinary Complex. Um, we just call it CMC for short. And um, it was moved here in 2014 under the curator and later director um, Dr. Alan Frank, who you saw earlier, he's now at UF. And um, just to give you um, a little bit of a close up here, I want to take a short moment to acknowledge some of the important people who helped establish our collection here. This is Olga Lakala. Um, she might be, uh, the name might be familiar to some of you. She um, was a Finnish immigrant and amazing botanist. Um, she was hired as the curator uh, here the year that the herbarium was moved from Brooksville to Tampa, Florida. And um, there's actually a herbarium in Minnesota named after her, the Olga Lakala Herbarium at the University of Minnesota Duluth, where she was curator before she came here. And a lot of her specimens or her duplicate specimens are deposited in major herbaria in North America and abroad. She also collected about 10,000 of our specimens that we have here in our collection. Um, another person I want to mention here, and you can also admire his lovely lab coat up, up close. Um, this is Robert Long. He is no longer with us. Actually, um, none of these individuals are, um, but I wanted to mention him because he's also, um, he's, he was a curator in 1962 and eventually uh, the director in 1965. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge George Cooley, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I want to acknowledge him for his many charitable contributions to the founding of the USF Herbarium. Um, he not only funded the herbarium in its initial stages, but he also funded many expedition trips and acquired many important books for our botanical library that we call now the George Cooley Library. And unfortunately, I will not have time to walk you through that library today, um, maybe a different time. But all right, so follow me and we're going to take a look inside. I'm going to show my face again. All right. So as you can see behind me, this is our main room collection, our main collection room. And as I said before, the vast collection exceeds 300,000 voucher specimens. And um, about three quarters or more of that is made up of plants and the rest from algae, bryophytes, lichens, and fungi. All right, so the first thing you do when you walk into the herbarium, hopefully, is that you will sign into our guest list. I already did that for you guys. So um, this is our main collection area. And I want to walk over here and show you some of the specimens that I wanted to share.
Um, this was our very first specimen officially accessioned into the herbarium. Uh, in 1951 by John Allen, the first USF president. And this, this uh, taxa is Calidoria Celestina, which is in the um, iris family. And we'll zoom in a little bit there because there's a little bit of glare. And then next, I wanted to show you um, the specimen that was named after George Cooley, Dismanthus Cooleyi. This is a specimen from Mexico. We have another specimen here from um, Asa Gray. The, um, he was one, the father of American botany. This is Clethra acuminata. It was collected in 1841. This is an isotype actually collected from our Olga Lakala. Next, I want to share with you a type specimen of Methistogodendron amnesium, um, which also is known commonly as the Bergmansia. Um, it is an isotype collected by Richard Evan Schultes, a famous biologist, and he's also known as the father of modern ethnobotany, which is the one of the first botany classes that I took um, as an undergrad and what really, really got me sucked into the world of botany. I have a photo of him here to represent him in the field. He traveled all over the Amazon collecting specimens and documenting what he learned from cultures about their medicinal compounds. And then I also have a um, specimen here from Ines Mexia. She was a American Mexican botanist. Um, I, I adore her story. She actually didn't start her career until she was 55 years old. Um, and there's a book that I bought here all about her collection um, uh, uh, journeys and everything that she contributed to um, finding new species and all of Central America and South America from Mexico to Peru. And one of the last specimen collections that I want to show here belongs to da, 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 Dr. Bruce Hansen, who is here today. And I will uh, introduce you guys to him in a little bit. Um, he actually helped me to choose a specimen as it is a great example of a beautiful specimen that shows um, different life stages of um, this banana plant. Yes, it is a banana. And um, it, he, he told me it was very difficult to mount. So I made sure I wanted to get you guys to look at how incredible this is. All right. And so I do want to mention this collection of books here that I have. Um, these are the multi-volume Flora, Flora of Florida along with the three, um, the three editions of the Guide to Vascular Plants of Florida. Uh, originally, um, the first uh, edition written by Richard Wonderland, who is the um, emeritus, uh, emeritus curator, emeritus uh, director. And later, um, Wonderland and Hansen uh, got together and co-authored the latest guide to the vascular plants of Bible, which or Bible. <laughs> I just said Bible that because it is my Bible. <laughs> I use it. I use it to uh, to um, ID almost everything in here. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Anyway, so these are the um, different copies here, and we are going to walk over and see that we also have specimens from bryophytes and lichens. Now these are, I can't get too close to, the, to these, but this is just a little bit of uh, an example of some of the uh, ways, different ways that we um, preserve these specimens. And here you have an example of the algae specimens that we have many of.
And um, here you'll find um, part of our macro fungi collection, which many of these were actually collected by Dr. Alan Frank. And um, I love this one that he provided a um, photograph with. Uh, a lot of people, well, maybe not as common as you think, but some people do uh, deposit specimens with photographs. Um, I think depending on the taxa, um, it is very helpful to understand uh, what it looked like before it dries. So that's why they provided these photos here. All right, and you're gonna see my face again here. I just wanna give you a different perspective. So you can see the cabinets here. They're also um, a compactor system similar to EUF and they hold the cases back to back on a carriage that's easily movable. Uh, the vascular plant specimens are arranged in the USF herbarium by a modified Dala Tor and Harm system, where each family is given a number and they're arranged in, um, in sequence. The sequence generally follows the evolutionary relatedness based on um, the understanding at the time. Um, so the order of the USF cases usually starts um, in a different room, but it's from ferns, gymnosperms, monocots and dicots, vascular plant specimens without known provenance, uh, also known as cultivated plants, are in these separate, separate cabinets over here. And just to give you a little peek here, when we're looking for a specific um, sheet or accession, uh, we will refer to the plant number or the family number, I'm sorry. Now I'm gonna walk over here and I wanna just quickly give you a little tour of what it looks like inside these cabinets. And we have everything organized, color-coded. This is our little cheat sheet. <laughs> um, so right now uh, we have Florida, um, the Southeast, North America here all color-coded. And so those colors that you see will match where all of these specimens were collected from. All right, now I said we we're gonna meet with Bruce Hansen. And I know he's around here somewhere. Aha, there he is, Dr. Bruce Hansen. Is not only Bruce Hansen's office, but it is also where the magic happens. <laughs> this is where all the specimens are mounted. There's Dorika, she's one of our volunteers. She just joined us at the beginning of this year. Um, she is mounting some specimens here. And this is where we set our specimens to dry. This is our dryer. All right, thank you. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> All right, now we're going to make our way over to Anita. <laughs> Hi, Anita. <laughs> All right, so I just wanna talk a little bit about our digitization process. So um, we've been digitizing uh, the collection since 2003, that's almost 20 years ago. And the Atlas changed to, to the Atlas of Florida plants after adding the bryophyte collection in 2016. So mainly what Anita is working on right now is um, she's transcribing information from labels. I'm just gonna zoom in here a little close to see what you're doing here. So she's transcribing the information from these labels onto our plant database, which is being uploaded live um, as she's inputting each specimen. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that we also have a cocoa dimmer, uh, which is the largest seed in the world. All right, thanks, Anita. <laughs> Bye. All right, we're going across the hall now. Yes, we have rooms. So here we find the cryptogams, uh, which are known as the ferns. The gymnosperms also are here. Those are corn, uh, cone bearing. And I will show you my favorite cabinet here and if you wonder why it's my favorite because it smells really good 
<laughs> All right. And so this is the room where um, a lot of the monocots and dicots are also stored. Uh, we have a large collection of uh, bro 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 bromeliads, um, as well as begonias that have not been accessioned that are currently um, on pause, although I did speak to the two botanists that were working on this project five years ago, and they agreed they're coming next week to uh, kind of catch up with that. Um, so let me flip the camera around here so you guys can see our digitizing station or our photo digitizing station, I mean. Um, so over here is where the last step in digitizing specimens happens. So as you can see, we have a camera set up here that's connected to our computer where we upload each image onto the um, Atlas of Florida. And I had that kind of opened up here. Some of you might be familiar with this website here. Um, any, uh, any species that grows in Florida that's been recorded is going to be, um, it's going to be, a, you're going to be able to access that information from our website there. All right. Here's a little bit more of a wider angle here. And we also have our lichen collection. I showed you some earlier, but all right, now we're going to make our way back to the display case. All right, so we have reached the end of our tour. And I just wanna thank you all for joining me. And I hope that you all now love Herbaria as much as I do. And I really wanna thank our staff and uh, volunteers. Um, I don't have everyone pictured on here, but I'm very thankful for everyone coming together and helping us um, organize this. And thank you, Austin, for organizing this as well. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Uh, it's been pretty fun to see everyone's uh, tours walking around. And right now we are south of Miami here in southernmost Coral Gables and I think a really kind of unusual herbarium. Uh, this is the Fairchild Herbarium. And just right off the bat, it, it's, it's a quiet day here because Thursdays and Fridays we don't have our volunteers. Our assistant curator isn't here. And actually many of the people who come and work here are affiliated with Fairchild, but at other institutions. So Miami is the largest metropolitan area in the state with over 5 million people. This is the primary uh, collection. So we work a lot with graduate students, and professors at Florida International University, at University of Miami, and even Montgomery Botanical Center and also the USDA. Um, so we got a lot of different people in today uh, from different places. And this gets curious because we're actually not at the grounds of Fairchild Garden. This is a mile south on the grounds of Montgomery Botanical Center. And it's actually a hundred year lease. And this property, it's about eight acres, a different institution. And that's where our nursery, archives, library, and of course herbarium is located. And that's where I'm coming to you from now. Um, just very briefly, I'm Brett Jestro. I actually, came to Miami to start my graduate studies 17 years ago, and I've been affiliated with Fairchild since. I was a barium curator for some years, but about five years ago, I became director of collections, meaning I also run horticulture. So I still love coming back to the herbarium. I still collect specimens, but I, I was mainly at the garden today, but I, I come by the herbarium every day to do and do something. So let's, I think, before I get into the specimens and our sort of curious array, because it's not all Florida floristics, uh, and it's certainly not the epiphytes of Selby. Let's just show you the room and kind of give a quick little uh, look. So right now we're in the center room of the herbarium. I might flip it sideways, make it a little wider. And basically, we only have three primary rooms. We have one wing with permanent collections. We have this main room, which is where the volunteers and where a lot of the mounting and processing goes. And then we have the second wing. Now we have a fourth room, which I could take you to later if people want to question and answer. It's actually on the other side of the building. And the reason is, is because that's where our dryer and freezers are. We're quite paranoid about insects here with our tropical climate. So we try to keep them as far away as possible. 
But basically, as you see, just kind of give process, these cabinets here, basically we have stuff ready to mount, sew, accession, and works its way down to our scanning area. Uh, but just so you see how it comes in. So everything here has already been frozen. So we don't allow anything fresh in this area. And actually we got some duplicates in here recently. That's from Alan Frank. Good collection, Alan. Thank you. You sent me those uh, exchange recently. And so we do actively exchange and we have active collecting going on. But anyway, I'm gonna walk into the first room of the collections. And it basically the, the main layout, we do have wood collections to the left, a few different types of wood collections. Uh, one really fun one was from the early days of Fairchild, it's basically all native trees. And each of these rounds is tied to an herbarium specimen and each one has also slides. So we can just, any species, we can look at three different sections of that wood uh, for wood ID. And this is where the main collection starts. It starts with the primitive spores like lycophytes. These are all vasculatures. And as we go through the vasculars, we start getting to thinking, what are our main collections here? And I think we got three main groups at Fairchild. Of these 250,000 collections, one main group we have taxonomically are cycads and palms. That's making, there's actually a lot of different working cabinets as well as FAU's collections. So FAU also donated their, their collection here. So it's kind of become a nexus. So I'm coming back in the main room, but I think what's interesting about the palms and cycads, really palms and cycads of the world, and they are large collections. So with palms, we may have 5,500 or so collections, but they may take up about 25% of our space. We'll see some can be multiple boxes. Uh, quite large, uh, but I'm looking here. This is a collection from Irian Jaya. This is a type. So people were mentioning the importance for nomenclature defining a species. Um, we don't have that many types. We're nowhere near Selby's 4,500. We have 220, but it's mainly palm cycads and Caribbean plants. So again, we have significant palm cycad, and also Caribbean. And I, really when I talk Caribbean, I mean the Caribbean basin in the broadest sense possible in that I consider South Florida a bit a part of that. So we have a great collection of southernmost Florida, really Collier, maybe Palm Beach South through the Keys, as well as the Caribbean islands. So that's been a real focus. Um, we kind of have a general layout. But again, it goes from monocots. And again, I'm still looking at palms here. We haven't even gotten past palms uh, out of the size of this building. So palms are large, so are cycads. So we kind of have this nomenclatural focus that's historical. We still have active collecting going on. Montgomery Botanical Center uh, still actively collects quite a few zamia uh, from the Central and South America, as well as Larry at NBC, who collects a lot of palms from Brazil. Um, so we still have active collecting and we still have researchers coming in. Right now, I'm just going to kind of show this. So our, our collection was only from 1967. It was built specifically for labs and the herbarium. The labs have now, as of 10 years ago, are all at the main garden. But what we have here is now really the library archives, we call it the natural history collection. So our labs are over there, but it's not too bad when we have to move a little bit. But this is one of our oldest collections. This is from 1840, collected in Florida. And or orchid still holding some color, which is sort of nice, but it still gets used. And what's interesting, because we have these different institutions, we have very different uses that can happen. Um, this is actually donated to us in the 70s from the National Arboretum. But there's so many different uses. And this sort of had even, I haven't heard yet about carbon and nitrogen isotope studies. These specimens are useful for carb, you know, cycling of nutrients. And also pollen, a lot of people doing coring of lakes in different areas to look at what was there historically. So a lot of different uses and even, you know, old specimens get new one. One kind of neat collection we have is the Charles Deering herbarium, which of course was some of the early days collecting with John Kunkel Small in New York. So it actually went, then to the Buswell Herbarium, which was the herbarium at the University of Miami. Um, but the Buswell then came here. 
So we kind of, we have specimens quite a bit older. This one's from 1904. It's a Lycaria that's really only still occurs in Simpson Park in Miami, at least in Florida. Again, we're kind of part of that whole Caribbean. So it's definitely in other parts. And sort of another uh, fun collection from the Buswell collection is actually collected by Buswell himself in 1940. And it's a ghost orchid in bloom, which of course we would not collect today. Um, on a curious side note, we do have a ghost orchid bloom at Fairchild right now. And so it's sort of interesting to see that it did occur in Pinecrest, which is wild. Um, so anyway, we definitely have a lot of South Florida. We definitely have palms. This is, again is another, just a collection, another type of a calamus. But just if you haven't seen many palm collections, they can be complicated because there's lots of parts. And this is where they get very bulky very quickly. Um, so what else? So again, I wanted to mention the kind of Caribbean. One thing, the project that was done here a ways back was the floor of the Bahama archipelago. And that was done by Corel here. And so this is actually, again, we like to keep the paper with our type. And this is one he describes during the flora, um, but also we were able to go back and recollect it because of specimens. And this is where we actually collect to grow a lot. So this is one I, would, I did. Our active Caribbean collection has mainly been with FIU graduate students. We had two finish their PhD last year, um, but I still will collect actually, not for the last two years of COVID, but hopefully be doing more. Uh, how else does it work? Now, obviously anyone can come here and sample from almost any research project, but we basically have kind of this Palms and Psych is the world, broad Caribbean collections, but we also want to focus on the cultivated plants of South Florida. So that's our third area of focus. And this is actually a plant that came into Fairchild as seed from Papua New Guinea's forestry department in 1964, unidentified. It was made a specimen by Scott Zona in the 90s and 2000 was ID'd by Dransfeld at Kew. And 2014, it was used for DNA studies. Um, what's also fun is this plant is still alive. So this is still in our rainforest exhibit. And probably one of the most studied individuals of its taxon. Um, so we think about growing, we think about sharing. A lot of when we collect, this is when I collected just because I'm familiar with, um, with it, is was collected both with Haitian and Dominican colleagues. And so we share the specimens we collect. This is the way we keep track of what we're collecting. So we, if I go to the Caribbean islands, I always have duplicates. Um, sharing duplicates is very important if anything gets destroyed, but it also lends a way of knowing what we're all doing and keeping track. We try to take as much info as we can, both GPS as well as where it came from as specifically as possible. And I think what most people are surprised with is the identification is the least important. You can always do that later. It's everything else in the specimen that counts. In this case, we got an ID, and this is actually a description from Bijan Dagan. I think he was at UF for a long time. It was a neat plant, but again, we collected seed. Now we collected seed. We were able to grow it at Fairchild. They were able to grow it at the Lakai Botanical Garden in Haiti, but the seed didn't work. Something went wrong in the Dominican Republic. So I was actually able to send them seed recently to try and try to grow this. It's actually related to quite a few popular detrophas. You know, Tegorima, I think it could be a fun hybrid to make or something like that. Um, so growing plants is also important here. And yeah, sort of a curious collection. So I've shown you over, I guess, the two main rooms. I'm here by my lonesome. And I will pass this back to Austin Mast. So again, I'm Austin Mast, and this is Florida State University's Robert K. Godfrey Herbarium. And uh, the collection was, the herbarium was founded in 1940. We had, as of at the last day of 2021, 269,280 mounted specimens. And uh, we also have a large Gulf of Mexico diatom collection in another room. Our top collectors have been Robert Godfrey, whose picture I showed you earlier, and Lauren Anderson, who was my predecessor. Uh, 
Lauren is a prolific collector. Last year, he collected 470 new county records. Those are cases where a species had not been collected in the county previously. Those are similar numbers to what he's done in the last several years. We have, uh, in the past decade, grown through some generous donations of collections. The Stetson University so Herbarium donated, donated to uh, this, uh, this herbarium, herbarium in 2014. And there, and there have been, been some important private, private collections, collections that have been donated to us, including Travis and Karen McClendon's in 2019 and Ed and Lisa Kepner's in, Lisa 2020 Kepner's in 2021. Our major focus is the biodiversity hotspot that is uh, what I showed you on the map here in the panhandle of Florida. We have uh, probably the best collection in the world from that particular hotspot. We also have uh, uh, a strength in Central America, particularly Costa Rica and Panama. Uh, I have a few representative specimens here, uh, some of the special things coming from the uh, panhandle. This includes Taxus floridana, which is a species of tree. Can you, can you mute that? Thanks. Uh, this is a species of tree that is restricted to just two Florida counties, which is amazing. We also have quite a bit of of diversity in terms of insectivorous plants here in the panhandle. You can find all of Florida's six species of pitcher plants here. This is one of them. This is white top pitcher plant, and this is a um, state endangered species that has a distribution that starts just to the west of us here in Tallahassee. But there are other things like uh, sundews. We have um, five species of sundew here in Florida, all of which you can find here in the panhandle. Uh, we also have uh, butterworts. Um, we have uh, six species of butterwort in Florida, and you can find all of them uh, here as well. This is another um, specimen that I'll point to. This is Hymenocallus godfrey. There are several species in our flora that were named for Bob Godfrey, uh, meaning that he was an important person in identifying them as a new species. The code does not allow you to name things after yourself. In fact, uh, Jane Ogilvy a few years ago uh, made a t-shirt design for us that you might be able to see there. It has Godfrey spelled out with the species that were named for him, including Hymenocallus godfrey and some others. The herbarium spans several rooms. I'm not going to show them all to you, but this is the main room. It's a long room. We have the majority of our collection here. And uh, we're also doing digitization in this room. Marley's behind me. She's taking photos. and. Uh, creating those digital images that we share online. Um, Fritz is here. Uh, Fritz is a graduate student curator in the collection. I'll just ask him to say hi. Hello, I'm <clears throat> Fritz Pichardo. And as Ozzy mentioned, I'm a PhD student here and also the current graduate curator at the Godfrey Herbarium. <clears throat> My, you know, I've been working related Related with herbarium a long time since my career. I started like as a volunteer, in mounting species, uh, specimens in the National Botanical Garden in Dominican Republic as a way of like learning the local flora. That's definitely uh, uh, useful. Uh, and um, and later on, all my research has been in kind of involved with herbaria, from going to using it as a reference for identifying species for studies of uh, plant compositions down to using uh, uh, the different occurrences of the plant specimens for using as a basis for understanding the past distributions um, of different groups like uh, a palm, South American palm 
I work with uh, in my masters the, uh, from the group is where is the SIE. And all that led to now where I am using these big data sets of urban specimens to better identify biogeographic areas with the focus of the evolutionary, cherry evolutionary history of the species there. And I still feel like the most amazing thing with herbaria is that when you pull out this genus species a, a folder and see this diversity that you seldom see like in the field, you only see like maybe one of your species and that's something that's maintained like, um, it is most engaging that I find. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. That's fantastic. Um, there's one more thing that I'll show you that we're working on. And this would be easier with a phone, but uh, we'll see if we can do this. So again and again, you've seen that these are, uh, let's, let's stop and say hi to Marley on the way. Hey, everyone. I'm Marley. <laughs> I'm an undergraduate intern here. Thanks, um, Marley. Oh, sorry. I was, I'm currently imaging right now. So. There's one more stop. And uh, what we've been doing is we've been trying to um, develop a way to document the 3D um, of the plant prior to pressing it in the field using photogrammetry. And this is a project that we've been doing with a, a pair of graduate students from our art department. Um, my son actually look, uh, discovered this um, it's a, a lightweight studio that you can take into the field if you have a power source. And uh, what we've gotten it to do is, um, let's see if I can make this happen. Um, so this is, this is the uh, light studio. And uh, what we've gotten it to do is we've developed an ability to take about 96 photos over two minutes. Uh, using the setup. And uh, what I have in here is a zamia reproductive structure, and you might or might not be able to see that well. But the, um, let me see if I can get this to work. Okay, so. Um, I'm controlling the whole thing on my phone on an app. And uh, what I can do is I can see if that works. OK, so at this point, I'm going to set it up to take, uh, I'll get it started with 48 pictures. That means that it's going to make 48 stops as it rotates the thing around the 360 degrees. and. Here you can see maybe things moving in here, the camera. And what ultimately you can do with this is you can uh, produce models like what we've done here. This is a beauty berry that's in Florida, a uh, species from Florida. And um, this is on Sketchfab, which is a way to share 3D images and you can um, manipulate it. You can take measurements. You can do morphometric analysis and that sort of thing. So we're trying to capture data that's lost in the process of collecting things, flattening them and drying them. We will do a course on this. Uh, it's going to be a two hour course in about a month. So if you're interested, do keep an eye open. Uh, this is through iDigBio. Um, um, project that some of you will be familiar with. Okay, so that's the that's the God for your barium. It's a great resource. It's a great place to um, the Florida is a great place to be a biologist. I think is what I mean to say. Okay, I am going to uh, go back to the view in which we can see everyone. And uh, we'll see if anybody has any thing to add here at the end.
Okay, it looks like we have a question from Sophia and I'll answer this one live. Uh, you mentioned a diatom collection. What does that storage look like for such a small specimen? Um, it's really two different things that are stored. There's the collection of the sample um, and that's gonna be stored in alcohol. And, and that's a whole bunch of diatoms and dinoflagellates and other microalgae. Uh, and then we also have samples of that sample that are on glass slides. And those are, um, those are stored differently. Good question. Okay, any other questions? You can use the Q&A, you could use the chat too if we can keep that uh, in view. Does anyone else have anything to add? We're, we're pretty much on time here with our, our ending. We're just um, coasting into the, the final few minutes. Well, I hope that you enjoyed it. As, as an audience member, uh, this was an experiment for us. We've never tried this before. I don't know if anybody's ever tried this before. And um, I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate my, my co-hosts. I was really grateful that uh, upon sending the email to each of them, there was a quick response and uh, it was all positive. Um, so we got everybody on the schedule. And again, I wanna emphasize the fact that these are uh, just a quarter of the herbaria here in Florida. And those other herbaria are also very, very important doing very interesting work.